Great. All right. So we are recording. Um, after the webinar this afternoon, I'll be posting um, the recording of today's webinar onto our website behind the MySusta login. Um, there's a page called Past Webinars. Uh, where you'll be able to um, to share this and rewatch it, um, share it with your colleagues, that kind of thing. Um, but we're really happy that you are all with us this morning uh, for our Export Fundamentals webinar. Um, everybody's muted, and if you have questions, um, just put them into the Q&A or the chat, and we'll get to those at the end um, after Victoria's presentation. Um, Golden Crest Global, Victoria Wasike, has been our export readiness um, trainer and consultant for the last several years um, and has really filled a gap and a need that we found. Um, you know, we have a lot of small businesses interested in exporting um, and we realized that, you know, there was um, a need for more education on the kind of the nuts and bolts. So Victoria has really stepped in and provided that education and we're excited to hear from her today. So uh, Victoria, I will go ahead and hand it over to you. Okay, thank you so much, Danielle, and thank you to everyone who's on the uh, webinar today. Uh, today's webinar is titled Export Fundamentals Overview. It's a wonderful webinar because we go ahead and we break down uh, nine important topics that you need to know in order to export. We provide you mainly with the what in this webinar because it is only 1.5 hours or a little bit over an hour um, and not really the how. OK, so we have another class that will come up in fall that you can learn the how. But really, this is just an overview, as we say, export fundamentals overview. So you kind of know what's going on when you export and just have, you know, be familiar with some of the concepts. So let's get started. So once again, as Danielle said, my name is Victoria Wasike, President and CEO of Golden Crest Global. Um, I have a little bit of information about myself just to run down uh, a brief bio. But uh, I was a manager of... Um, a trade manager for the state of Iowa and focusing on Asia. Then I moved over to be the manager of international business development, uh, focused on foreign direct investment worldwide for the state of Iowa. I am a lawyer by uh, by trade and training. Um, and so I work for Davis Brown Law Firm, now Denton's Davis Brown in the international and litigation divisions. Um, while at Iowa, I manage activities for offices in Europe, Japan, China, Taiwan, and Mexico. Um, led quite a few governor-led trade missions while there to India, Japan, and South Korea. We lead uh, trade missions even now. We just had one in April for a client, so we do them all the time. Um, and then had some a few governor appointments regarding Europe and then um, and Japan. Uh, presented through uh, out you know Europe and Asia. Was an adjunct professor at Drake University um, Law School and also the College of Business. And finally, I have a master's in public policy from George Mason University, undergrad from UCF in Florida. Uh, I'm from Florida, and I was a high school teacher in D.C., so I love to teach. Teaching's in my blood. My mom's a teacher, uh, so I can't get away from, I think, the teaching part, which is why I love to do export range training. So, so happy you can join us. Um, those of you who are, on the, who are on the webinar, once again, please welcome. I want to just give you a quick overview of what's coming up. It's so exciting, and this is so wonderful that SESA offers this training. We have uh, fall 2023 export readiness uh, training class starting very soon. So I'll give you a little bit of background about it. This training includes three sessions, four modules. They're four hours each, so just 12 hours total. And we will teach you all you need to know about exporting in 12 hours. It's really amazing. The best thing is, like I said, this webinar teaches you what, but not how. Uh, in this session, we actually teach you how. So it's really detailed, it's 12 hours, but you really have the confidence afterwards. Very quickly, these are the dates. You can sign up right now. Um, the registration is still open. Put them on your calendar. We're going to have it um, October 10th. Sorry, not October 10th. October 4th, 11th, and 18th. And they're going to be between 8.30 and 12.30 uh, Central Time. So sign up today, and then you get a wonderful uh, certificate afterwards. Very quickly, the curriculum is very detailed. We have, like I said, um, three, uh, three modules. It covers four sessions. Um, and basically are and, and 12 topics. And these are the topics here. Once again, they're a little more detailed than what we cover in this webinar. And it's for 12 hours and it teaches you exactly what to do, how to export. You can sign up right now. Danielle, when she sends out the link, you can sign up immediately. And then you'll get a little uh, questionnaire that can kind of assess where you're at. 
you know, what you know currently, you know, um, a few like your current experience. So we know exactly where you're at, too. It's a great uh, little tool. We also provide wonderful handouts. So this is the favorite of everybody because you can't memorize 12 hours worth of information, right? So we provide wonderful handouts that are very succinct that kind of goes over the curriculum so you can have them forever pull them out when you need to. They have links and you can click on the links and all of that and the handouts. And then we also, of course, we have to have a little bit of homework. The homework is great because it lets you shepherd yourself through the program. It lets you look at your own markets and your own sectors and do your research in time, right? And so if you need a little hand holding, this is perfect. Um, and so I highly recommend this course. Um, it's very interactive. We usually have some kind of seasoned exporter join us and an industry expert so you can pick their brains too, hear about the wonderful highs and sometimes lows, but hopefully mostly highs uh, with exporting. And then once again, you get a wonderful certificate. Looks better than this, but this is my little version. Finally, just some positive feedback about that training. I suggest you sign up today, but Golden Crest Global presented a comprehensive training on exporting products to the global market. The training was top-notch and professional. We were honored to be a part of it, and we are um, a better for the knowledge gained. This, this is a company that participated, the first, participated during the first training we ever had. And then another one, this is the one I love because this is what we want to do. We want to have confident exporters. That's what we're seeking to always have. So after this training, I now feel equipped with the knowledge and language of exporting. Importantly, I feel like I'm more confident, which is, I love those words, uh, going into potential export opportunities. And so that was another company. So please sign up once again today. You'll get a little taste um, for what this training is about, but really the 12 hours is just such a great tool. So you can have um, educated exporters who can utilize all of SESTA services. And that's really what our goal is. So enough about that. Um, I want to go ahead and talk about the webinar today. So we have a couple of topics we're going to cover, nine topics in total. So we're going to fly. Um, but we're going to talk about classifying your products for export. Our second topic is your export plan and foreign market research. Our third topic is free trade agreements. Our fourth topic is foreign import requirements. Fifth topic, pricing products for export. Our next topic will be finding partners and buyers. And then finally, we're going to go over pro forma invoices and Inkle terms, shipping and logistics, and finally, export payment, financing, and insurance. We're not going to cover so much the insurance part because, once again, this is just an hour webinar, but um, we're going to kind of hit on all these topics. So bear with me. Stay with me. It is quite a bit. But like I said, you'll know what but not really how, but at least you'll know kind of what are the key fundamental things to think about when you're exporting. So let's start with the first thing, classifying your product for exports. Whenever you export or whenever you even do market resource research, you have to classify your product, which means you have to get a code for your product so that you can actually go ahead and pull data right? Um, and even when you export, they're going to ask for your uh, certain codes or numbers. And you want to make sure that you do this like your first step, right? So it's needed for market research and you need classification codes, sometimes for your product, okay? And that's the most common one. And sometimes you'll have it for your industry. So product is like your specific product. You'll have a code. If you have multiple types of products, like you sell coffee and tea, you're going to have different codes. Even if you sell like two T's, but one's organic and one's not, you'll have different codes. So everything is coded and that's how you're able to kind of pull the data. So that's pretty much your first step, classifying your products for export. So what are they? Uh, they are numerical identification codes and they're used nationally and internationally. So they are harmonized codes, right? Um, so mainly you're, when you use it to ship, um, you're speaking the same language as someone else internationally when you use these codes. Um, you're used. Uh, you're going to use them to pull market research, to pull data. And we'll talk about that a little bit. Much we go into much more deeper dive, of course, in the in the longer session. But really, you know, um, when you want to pull information about key markets, about trends, about how your product is doing, of course, in the past, and even projections for the future and different markets, then you're going to need these codes. And you should always do market research before you enter a market right? Shouldn't just answer an email and say, oh, this looks great and not do any research. So also, if you're going to ship goods overseas, you need to have this code because that's how they determine import taxes and tariffs, okay? 
So typically there are a few uh, codes that we really focus on. We cover a few more, but for these purposes, we'll focus on the HS code. That's a product code. And so that is a six digit code. And so that's when you're classifying your code up to six digits or six numbers. And then you have a schedule B number, which is 10 digits. So that's the six, six digit with four more digits afterwards. And that's how you classify, you know, your document or, or your, uh, your product. So as an example, you can see mine here, it says 090121. The first six digits, this is for coffee. Okay, this is a code for coffee. Um, you'll know because basically this is a chapter. So this is probably under like coffee, spices, teas, and it'll get more kind of particular as you keep going number wise and more particular. And so basically this is like non-roasted coffee beans. You know, the more digits it gets more particular, right? And then when you tack on the four digits afterwards, then that's your schedule B number. And this even classifies it more. So one zero might be organic right? Our five zero might be something else, okay? So these codes are very important. Um, you can go right on the Census Bureau and that longer class will, will teach you how to do this, but they're very readily accessible. There's a lot of kind of, um, um, you can just go on the Census Bureau and there's um, a, a database you can pull them from. The next type of code we kind of focus on is the NAICS code. You should be familiar with that because that's basically for your whole industry, right? And so let's say my product is, you know, um, decaffeinated coffee, but what's my whole industry, right? Maybe hot beverages or something like that. And so when you're trying to classify your industry and let's say you're using a market research tool and they're like, you know, for them to give you data, they're like, put in your HS code. So you put that in. Or if they want to be more specific with the data, they want to be able to give you kind of information that's a little more specific. They'll say put in your you know, schedule B number, which is 10 digits, which will go, you know, be very specific, like organic or not organic coffee or something like that. And then if they want to be very broad, like they want to give you, you want to like research information or, you know, use a database that's going to pull industry information, they'll ask for your NAICS code, okay? And once again, you can find that easily and you can use that to pull data. And want both of these, you can get those from the U.S. Census Bureau. They're the ones who collect all this information. So once you learn to, to classify your product, you know, you're kind of now ready to start looking at export plan and then your foreign market research. Once again, you never just want to wing it anywhere because it's so easy to do market research. Take the 12 hour class, we'll teach you exactly how with tons of free tools. And so you should never go anywhere blind. There's just no reason for it. You should never just look at an email or just go on a trade show and someone says, hey, ship your product to Japan. And you're like, yeah, okay. Like you don't know the trends, you don't know if you're going up or down, you don't know if there's you know barriers or anything. That's not what you do, right? And so you wanna always establish the export plan to be proactive, right? And then know how to do foreign market research so that when these opportunities just drop in your lap, which is great, you can take advantage of them. Okay, so that's saying, we have a trade mission to wherever. And you're like, that sounds great. Let me do my foreign market research, okay? So you want to sometimes, you know, conduct, look at a few areas. This is once again, very high level, but you'll do an industry analysis. That's, you know, your broader industry, maybe hot beverages or coffee as a whole or something like that, looking very broad, um, and so you want to know how does your industry fare? You know, uh, is it going up? Is it going down? You know, uh, is, is is some kind of other industry taking its place in certain areas that are no longer kind of interested in your industry or something like that? Um, and so just doing an industry analysis, usually pulling your next code information is very helpful. So you can see that larger picture, right? Oh, in Europe, my industry is trending down, but in Asia, hey, it's trending up. Right. So maybe I should focus on the market that's turning up. So that helps you to identify growing, emerging and successful markets, which is where you want to spend your time and energy. Right. So that industry analysis is kind of big picture, that next cult level. But it really does help you. And we'll teach you tools to find that if you take the 12 hour class. Then you want to say, well, I see Europe maybe be on the decline for my product because each product is different. So even someone says in general, oh, Europe is doing great. But if it's not doing great for your product or your industry, right, then you want to go ahead and find a place that is doing great. So once you go and look at the industry as a whole, then you want to start looking at particular markets, right? That's actual particular countries you want to look at, right? And so then you want to go ahead and determine your best foreign markets. Where, based on the data, 
right? Not guessing or not just reading an article. Uh, where is your product actually trending upwards? Determine which markets that have been most successful and is fastly growing for your product or fastest growing. That's very important. So you're going to industry, then you're going to look at target markets, right? So maybe you'll say, okay, in Asia it seems to be, you know, going pretty well. And I'm going to go ahead and start looking at Japan, South Korea, and Philippines. Because I've done my market research and I see once I research that the trends are going up. And I'm liking that. The next thing you want to do is a market analysis. So that's when, when you pick your three markets, and this is part of the homework that we do in our, our whole session. You pick your three markets, right? Your industry is doing good. Your market, you know, as a whole, you're looking at maybe Asia, you pick the three markets. Now you need to do a deep dive into those three markets, right? Because every country is different. We're going to see for foreign import requirements. Every country has different import requirements. Every country has different taste. Every country has different people, right? So you want to make sure you understand that actual market. So then you want to do that particular research and do deeper dives into that. What's the business climate? Uh, are there any kind of instabilities that's going to make this a rocky climate, a rocky place where they're doing great now, but maybe there's some unrest that's happening where their uh, their currency is going to fall? You want to go a deeper dive in there. So that provides a better understanding of the market, uh, research business. You want to research the business environment, the economy, the culture, because they might have different tastes, right? Maybe in Mexico, you can sell hot things, you know, spicy things, but maybe in Asia, they're like, mm, not so much. Or maybe in Philippines, you can do spicy, but maybe in Japan, you can't do so much. So you have to make sure you understand the market and you want to realize obstacles and you want to narrow your options down. So if you're looking at three markets, once you do that deep dive, you're like, hmm, Maybe for my my product or products, I should just stick to the Philippines. Okay, that help you to maybe narrow your your options. So that's very helpful. So finally, you want to think about free trade agreements. They're very helpful. We'll talk about this a little bit more in a second, but they will help reduce or eliminate tariffs, which are very helpful because that means your product can be competitive, right? The lesser the tariffs or our taxes on your product, the more competitive they can be because they'll be cheaper on the shelves, right? And so people will be more likely to pick up your product. So free trade agreements are very helpful. The U.S. has them with about 22 countries, 17 total free trade agreements. And we'll go over that in a little bit, but that can really increase your competitiveness of your product. Because when you're exporting, you're not competing against just your neighbor, like your domestic little competitors, right? You're not even competing against the people on the ground in the foreign country. So let's say we pick Philippines. They're going to have probably the same kind of people who make coffee too, right? So you're not even competing with the, your competitors in the U.S. and the competitors in your foreign country of interest, but then all other coffee makers all over the world might also be trying to come in here. So competition is always something you need to go and think about and free trade agreements because they make you cheaper because they can reduce the actual or eliminate the tariffs will make you more competitive as you compete. Okay, so just something to think about. We'll talk about that a little bit later. The next thing you want to do is a product assessment. So each product may not actually be sold internationally. I'm always very careful. Like you don't want to have all your products or your babies out on the market at the same time. Sometimes you want to be very strategic of the one that you actually put out there, right? So you want to look at your products. If you have one product, this is going to be very easy. But if you have other products, maybe you have like flavored coffee or you have like decaffeinated coffee or you have, I don't know, something else or something, you know, you might want to just look at all your products line, your line, your products in, in your, you know, in your production line and see which one actually will be best to export. And so you always want to do a product assessment. This is very high level. We'll talk about ways you do that you know, if you take the 12 hour course, but you want to quickly just list the product strengths and weaknesses, and then the reasons of for potential export success. We will talk about foreign import requirements at section four. We'll get to it in about two minutes or three minutes or something like that. But foreign import requirements will greatly, you know, help you figure out whether your product has weaknesses or they need to be tweaked or something like that. Um, but you want to determine if modifications are needed. And you want to be very strategic with which product you put out in the market for different markets, because each market is different too. Okay. 
So based on the reasons for potential export, decide whether you believe that one or more of your products have exporting potential. Now, sometimes, you know, if it's like a static, like you have a, a page or something that you can just list all your products, that's fine, right? But if you're going to go and really like target a market and really go into the market, your market research should really help you determine whether you need to do tweaks or whether you have a strong product for that particular market. So going back to free trade agreements, that's number three. Once again, they're very important because they can eliminate or remove a tariff. A tariff is pretty much a tax um, or, you know, um, on a product that's imported, right? Um, so if you're sitting and your competitor on the ground in the country can sell it for $20, but you're slapped with like a 20% tax, then you're naturally going to be higher on the shelf than someone domestically. Or if you have a competitor and that country of interest has a free trade agreement with that competitor, then that competitor's country, with well, that competitor's country, then they will be cheaper than you. So free trade agreements really help to balance and level the playing field when it comes to pricing and competition. So each free trade agreement has their own rules to qualify. And the 12 hour course will teach you exactly how to qualify your product and the documentation and everything. This is really high level, but you have online tools um, that will show you the information and tariff rates. Usually you wanna think, okay, my tariff will be zero, right? So let's say coffee to Japan. It was 12% before the free trade agreement. Japan just got a, like a free, free trade agreement or trade agreement with the US. So now it's 0%, right? So when I import or when I export that product and it's imported into, into Japan, I don't have to pay that 12% tax. Usually you don't pay anyway, the importer pays. But anyway, it still goes along with your product because even if they pay, they're gonna you know, jack up your product by the 12%. And so what you always wanna check is see um, how your benefit, how your product will benefit and you know, make sure that you understand the tariff rate. Because we always wanna think the free trade agreement will let me uh, you know, export my product for zero tariffs. But that's not true. Sometimes they phase them out Sometimes they'll start at, you know, your tariff was 12%. They'll do 8% the next year. They'll bring it down 8%. The following year, they may do, you know, 6% and they might phase it out over, you know, like five years to zero. So you always want to double check and know what your rate is going to be and to determine whether you're going to really benefit from the free trade agreement or not. But that's just a very good, good tool. Like I said, the U.S. has quite a few free trade agreements with various countries. Um, Australia, Bahrain, Chile, you have CAFTA, uh, DR, you have, which is uh, several of uh, Caribbean countries or um, Central American countries. You have uh, Colombia, Israel, Jordan, South Korea, Morocco, Oman, Panama, Peru, Singapore. Um, of course, you have US uh, MCA, which is Canada and Mexico that replaced NAFTA. And then you have Japan, which they have a, a trade agreement with from 2020. So once again, we do a really big deep dive into free trade agreements. This is so high level, but just as you're doing, you know, your market assessment, this is something you need to think about to see if it benefits you. So the way you determine your markets is very kind of, very simple. You just have to take the time to do it. So once you do your research and your research has revealed the largest, fastest growing and simplest market to penetrate, you want to kind of get all three of those. It's the larger market. It's the fastest growing. I know there's a trend upward and it's the simplest. They don't put a bunch of barriers in my place to get my product in there. Then you want to go ahead and kind of focus on those markets or define which markets to pursue. Okay. Sometimes it can be best to test one market out and then move on to secondary markets as you get you know, better with exporting. That sometimes is not the case, but usually it's kind of good to just kind of, you know, figure out and test, you know, your different strategies and products to see what works best. Um, sometimes focusing on a region will also be helpful because it can be more cost effective than just scattering all your products around the globe. But let me be clear, and we're going to talk about foreign import requirements in like literally two minutes um, because that's the next topic. Even though you have a cluster of countries, that does not mean that those countries are going to be the same. Right? So let's take, for instance, in the Gulf, right? The Gulf region. You have Saudi Arabia and you have UAE, right? They both would have different standards. We know that they have different standards as far as like what kind of uh, flavoring or what kind of, um, you know, food coloring can be used. So UAE, you can use some kind of food coloring and Saudi Arabia, you can't, right? So then you have to change your product. 
So sometimes, you know, just focusing on cluster, they each will have still their individual rules for you to abide by. So uh, once again, that might help maybe knowing the culture. You might know, okay, well, it has to be halal or, you know, this is the culture in general and maybe they only do letters of credit there and not do this, but you still have to look at those foreign import requirements because each country is different, okay? So let's go into foreign import requirements. So every country... Uh, sometimes when they're a region, they, they might have like the EU might have some kind of, you know, streamlined kind of rules, but they will have import requirements that must be adhered to. Because if you do not, your product will not get in. Or if it does, it'll be greatly delayed. Right. And no one's going to be happy. So you need to make sure that you look up the foreign import requirements before you ship your product. Um, and even not even before you ship, like it should be part of your market research because they are important to learn more about your product packaging. So if it's not packaged right, it's not getting in, right? Labeling, do you have to translate those labels? What has to be on the labels? Certification, a lot of products require certification. And we'll talk about that. A very high level, once again, this time, uh, about the certification like final sanitary or sanitary certificates, uh, certificates of free sale, all those great certificates, right? And then shipping requirements. Some of them have specific shipping requirements. Some of them require like paperwork. Some of them, some of them like Japan will require an actual kind of like, you know, map or um, like a drawing or, you know, um, a, something about like how your product is made and that kind of stuff. You have to know each country is different. So you need, need to know the information. The easiest way to do that is looking at the USDA FAIRS country report. FAIR stands for Food and Agricultural Import Regulations and Standards. They have them usually for most major markets. They have one nice website. We can't visit it today because interest of time, but take the 12 hour course. I'll show you how to do it. And then they have a wonderful, just simplified certificate report. Cause sometimes you just want to know, does my product need a certificate or not? Right, just tell me, <laughs> you know, don't let me guess. And so they have a wonderful certificate report for most uh, markets where you can just look at it and say, okay, yes, I need these three certificates. And every country is different. UAE requires a certificate of origin, origin, not organ, <laughs> origin. If you don't know that, right, and you didn't get one, you're not going to get your product in, right? Japan does not require that, right? That's a burden put on by the UAE, right? UAE requires a certificate of free sale by the USDA. Japan does not require that. For any shelf saver stable product they require. If you don't know and you didn't check these reports and you're just winging it, that's not good, right? So it's very important. So understand the import requirements are necessary to understand extra costs because you have to modify your product. You have to change whatever, you know, food coloring that's there. Or you have to now get some more labels. Luckily, Susta can help with that. On the call, Danielle comes on or the 12-hour the session and she explains exactly how uh, Susta can help uh, pay for a lot of these things, which are really great. Um, but if you're going to price your product right, you need to understand what uh, extra things you're going to do and how much these things are going to cost you. Once again, there's a page with all the countries. We can't go over it now, but it really will show all the countries and region. You click on it and you can get your fares and country reports. It's very helpful. Um, but once again, sign up for the full course. And so you'll really know how to kind of find those. But they're very important. You can't just guess and skimp. You don't even want to just trust your buyer. A lot of times your buyer, your buyer is your friend. Your buyer might know a lot of these, but these change all the time. I mean, I see it where one year is this and the next year is that. Right, especially with all the, the climate initiatives and the packaging where you could have this, but now it has to have these symbols on it and it has to show us recyclable, but has to have these symbols on it. It changes all the time. So you want to make sure that you understand, you know, what's the most current information, even if your buyer says, oh, yeah, just follow this example. Right. So you want to make sure you know yourself. So for an import requirements, once again, they cover great information like um, ingredients and manufacturing process lists. A lot of times they'll make you list your ingredients, some countries, not all, and they might list, you know, high level process lists, right? You don't have to be very detailed though. They'll make you spell out your process. They'll give you requirements for labeling. If you have to be translated, if it needs to be, you know, kill a cow or something else, or, you know, what metric system you need to use or whatever, what, what has to be on there. If you have to say non-GMO or something, packaging is a big thing, especially nowadays, especially with all this renewable and recycling, you must know the packaging, right? And see if you meet those requirements. Food safety, like additives, 
they vary from each country to country. So you want to make sure whether if you have artificial dyes or anything in your food, right, you want to make sure that it, it's okay and that it can go ahead and be entered in the country. Sanitary and phytosanitary requirements. A lot of times if you have um, some kind of vegetable or fruit product that hasn't really been processed, you'll need a phytosanitary certificate. If you have a meat product, right, um, then you're going to need a sanitary certificate oftentimes. And we teach you a deep dive of how to get those certificates in the course, but just make sure you're aware that you'll likely need some, some certificates and they have to go through an inspection and all that kind of stuff. Export certifications. Uh, sometimes you need like a certificate of um, origin or some other certificate. All depends on um, if, if there's a trade agreement in place. You'll need other certifications to show that your product was, you know, has is from a certain origin or was wholly produced or something like that within a country. So very important to once again check these foreign import requirements. Um, they also have information about, you know. Um, the rules of origin, endpoint procedures, duties, and documents you may need. And then they have information about trade facilitation and how they, you know, if your product is stuck in customs, stuck in customs or something like that, uh, they usually will have some kind of numbers or information for you to, you know, call and get assistance. So these are very important. Um, so once again, uh, you are so fortunate that you're part of the USDA system, hence you're, you know, here uh, with SESTA at the Department of Agriculture because, um, you know, USDA really do compile these wonderful reports. They're like 20 pages long. Like who can't read a 20 page report to figure out how to get your product in, right? They, they really do put together these wonderful reports that just has everything in one place. So it's very helpful. Um, export certifications, we kind of covered this. Once again, sanitary certificate if you have meat product, um, file sanitary sen certificate if you have like a non-processed fruit or vegetable. And then um, sometimes you need like a FDA or state agriculture certificate free sale. That's like in the case of UAE, they require that for every shipment now. Um, and then certificate of origin, you might need that. Sometimes if there's a trade agreement, but even if there's not a trade agreement like UAE, you might still need it. So um, just a high level things is some, sometimes what you what you might need. So we're going to move right along to pricing products for export. This is so important because you have to know how to price your products, right? To be competitive, very important. So some things you want to look at: you want to examine your export pricing and quoting from within your company, right? To determine uh, a good strategy. And this, we go into this a little bit more in the class, but this strategy is different for different people, right? Sometimes people have like a spreadsheet and they have like, you know, like uh, if it's from this country, we'll charge this. If it, But, you know, all of that takes into account that they thought about everything that goes into the pricing. There's a lot of things to think about. Okay. So you want to think about export pricing and quoting from within your company, those costs, right? And then you want to examine the price externally presented as landed cost to the buyer. So you have your own costs, right, that you need to cover. But then you need to think about the landed cost to the buyer because that is how much um, the, 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 um, that the product will sit on the shelf for. Right, because every time with the freight and the taxes and the tariffs, those are all passed along the bot to the buyer, right? And so sometimes, you know, the price of the buyer could be a lot higher. So you want to think about all these costs and you want to be competitive, but you also want to cover all of your expenses. So it's a very good exercise that you need to kind of go through to make sure you're not going to lose money. So just like anything. Um, just like the domestic market, if your product is priced too high, it would not sell, right? So you don't want that. That's just a waste of energy if it doesn't sell at the end of the day, right? If you're priced too low, your export activities may not be profitable, okay? So if you're priced too low and you didn't take into account like all the things you need to take into account when you export, uh, then, you, then you've lost money too, right? So you want to be very strategic and really take some time take some time to really figure out your pricing because usually it's going to be different from your domestic pricing. All right, some key considerations you want to think about, very high level here, but you want to think of your foreign market objectives because each market may be different, well, it is different, but your objectives for that market may be different. Maybe in one market, uh, you want to, you know, just 
get your toes wet. You don't just be introduced to the market because you see growth down the line. So you just want to kind of go in slowly, right? And build market share. So you might price it lower um, and you might have a more aggressive marketing campaign. So then there'd be more in the marketing budget and things like that. So think about your four market objectives. Sometimes people say, well, I have a surplus domestically, so I just need to find a market to just get my products and more so not dump them, but find a way just to kind of, you know, uh, get, get rid of ex excess product. So if, if that's your case, then you may not be as strategic, right? You may just be trying to find a place that's willing that, to pay high enough so just to cover your cost so you can just kind of more so, you know, um, get rid of some surplus for, for this year or this season. So all your foreign market objectives really do color your strategy, which is why you just should say, oh, just I'm going to just charge $55 or whatever. That's it. Right. Each market is different and your strategy in each market will be different. OK. And so that's why you want that's one thing that you should think of. The next thing is market demand. Always you want demand for your product, right? If there's no demand, you can tell by your market research that that will be a good start. But if there's no demand, you shouldn't be there, right? So really thinking about, well, who can pay for this product? Is there a really high per capita income? If not, is there a large expat community? If not, then, you know, can I resize my product? Uh, maybe this this market likes everything really small because they, they can't afford a lot. So they can't buy a big bag. They can only buy little small bags. Is there market demand for my product as is? Do I have to modify it to have a market demand? All those things you should think of because those will really equate to pricing your product. And really it boils down to can the buyer um, buy your product? Because if they have no money to buy it, that's an issue. And then on top of it, is it something that they actually want to buy because they like the product? Do you have the right flavors and those kind of things? So this can also kind of lead to you doing product modifications, but understanding how to price it right, the market demand is definitely something to consider. Always consider your competition, right? Um, competition means competing for a reason, right? You have competitors, once again, domestically, you have competitors in the country of interest, and you have competitors all around the world. So how you price your product, you want to be competitive. And so you want to go ahead and make sure that you know what your competitor is doing. Now it's so much easier with the internet, especially for larger kind of um, retailers. You can kind of go online in foreign countries and see what your competitor is, is priced for, right? That might be a start. Um, you can kind of see if, if, if it's pr priced pretty high, especially for a U.S. product or something like that. You can price, you know, do a, a premium. But looking at competition and figuring out what your competitor is doing is very important. And then finally, the cost, which we're going to talk about. Um, there are a lot of costs that go into exporting that will be separate from domestic, right? And what we really want to, and we show you this in a 12-hour class, how you really separate the costs that are not considered in your domestic sales and that are only particular to your exports so that you can price your exports properly. So speaking of that, uh, this may result in, result in export prices that are different from domestic prices. So do not be surprised, right? If your prices are greatly different, um, you know, from your, um, when you export from your domestic, domestic prices, because once you take all this into account, there might be a great difference. So also let's talk about landed costs very briefly. So landed costs, those are additional uh, costs that come along with exporting, and they are typically borne by the importer. So normally these are called pass-through costs, but you still have to think about them because they will still affect how much your price is being sold in the foreign country, okay? They're pass-through costs, which means your importer pays for them, but the end result is your buyer's paying for them, right? That consumer because, uh, you know, it's ultimately going to end up with the cost. And so um, we've had some some people participate in these trainings and they're just like, man, um, no matter what, by the time the, you know, I all the, the costs are accounted for and the landed costs or whatever, just, you know, my price is way higher than anyone else on the shelf, right? And so you have to think about the landed costs. And so they can greatly, they can add greatly to the final price paid. Sometimes it can be double of what is charged in the U.S. because once you tack on, you know, the shipping and the freight and the taxes, right? And then maybe a VAT or something like that, it really adds up. So these include tariffs, 
Usually tariffs are paid by the importer unless you choose the wrong income term, which we'll talk about in a second. Um, custom fees, that's very important. Transaction costs like shipping, value added taxes, all those will add up to the price of your product, right? And so let's just see uh, for an example. Um, this is just a little example to see how different it can be from like, you know, you selling uh, from, you know, domestically or actually from your factory or facility um, and seeing the difference of what the cost will be once it lands um, in the foreign country and the consumer has to pay. So let's see, let's say total production costs here, let's say from your facility, if you have 500 units at $50 a unit. So that means at your, you know, facility or production uh, place, it'll be $25,000 is pretty much the cost. But when you tack on freight, let's say $900, and let's say you tack on a customs fee at 2%, which is $500, and you tack on insurance, which is $500, and you tack on a tariff, this is pretty low, 10%, a lot of them are much higher than that. So that's $2,500. The total land it costs now, okay? That's not including like paying distributors and marketing and all that kind of stuff. That's just strictly the cost, like, like getting, the, getting the product over there. Right. So now your landed cost is twenty nine thousand four hundred. Right. Significantly higher. So where it was only fifty dollars per unit, you know, now you're looking at a, a total cost of fifty eight dollars and eighty cents, which may mean that you're not going to be competitive, especially when you start tacking on all the other costs. Right. So you want to always think about how that landed cost is going to affect your bottom line, too. So finally, very quickly, pricing products for export. You want to think of some operating expenses that are directly tied to your export shipment. These are kind of like standard things when you export, but fees for market research and credit checks. We will teach you how to do most of the market research for free in the class. But of course, sometimes you want to use other fancier um, ways. And sometimes your department of agriculture might have a subscription that you can kind of get for free. But if you want to use, you do credit checks or anything like that, that can cost money. Business travel expenses, that can cost money. Of course, SESA can reimburse sometimes for, for, you know, maybe trade shows and stuff like that, but you want to still account for those. Uh, promotional materials, that costs money. Translation costs, commissions and training costs for a foreign representative, um, definitely will cost money if you have, you know, people on the ground. If you want to think about legal, patent, or trademark fees, taxes, export-related insurance, product modification. If you have to change your whole product, our special packaging will add, you know, costs. And then finally, these are passed through, like I just said, but transportation fees, freight forwarding fees, and that kind of stuff. And then if you're going to give any kind of discounts, like sometimes people give discounts and not use a letter of credit and stuff like that, um, then you need to account for that, right? And so you need to kind of account for those things too. So these are just very high level things that you want to think about when pricing your products for export, but it all will go into, you know, making sure that you are competitive, but you don't lose money, right? And so that's what you want to focus on. All right, we're looking at number six, finding partners and buyers. So, um, you know, once you start looking to sell in a foreign country, especially if you're going to be proactive and you kind of narrow down, you know, the markets that might be good. There's a couple ways you can sell. So we're going to just go over really high level right here. But um, sometimes you can do indirect selling when you're kind of using an intermediary, so it's such an export management company. Um, and there's no right or wrong way in one market. You might say, I want to be a direct seller where I directly go engage with the market. And you're like, well, this market, all the numbers are looking good. The trends are great, but I'm just not that comfortable. So then you can kind of do indirect selling where you're not dealing directly with the buyer, but you're utilizing an intermediary, such as an export management company. And we don't have time to go into exactly what those are in this course, but that's just the way you can sell in the market. And then you can go ahead and do direct selling. If you say, you know what, I want to go ahead and I want to sell directly, not use like a, a middle person or a management company, but I actually am going to engage, spend my time, you know, learn the market, find a distributor or find the, the customers and that kind of stuff. And that's direct selling. And so you deal directly with the buyer. There are some advantages with that. Of course, as you can think, you have more control. Um, we've seen it where, you know, 
people are not happy sometimes with the, you know, cause you kind of turn your product over and they might, might not be as happy of what's happened because you kind of lose control. Um, you have higher products because of course you're not paying a middle person, um, lower prices cause you're not paying a middle person, more competitive cause you're not paying a middle person. Right. And then you have close contact with the customers and market. So if things are changing and, Oh, this is not in style anymore. And now this is in style. You can hear about it sooner and you can kind of make changes. And so that's advantages. But the disadvantages are if you do direct selling, it takes more time, right? You really have to have someone dedicated. Anyway, you need someone dedicated export. This is not something you just pick up for like five hours, as you could probably see from this course, and you just kind of wing it, right? So more time, personnel and resources, longer time for product awareness, because sometimes if you have a novel product, and you have to really kind of get the awareness out. Um, if you're doing it directly, it might take a little bit longer. And of course, you'll have less knowledge of experience, so it might take a little bit longer to ramp up. So just depending on your strategy, neither one is right. And you might choose a different strategy for each market because each market is different, right? So another thing, um, a lot of times, you know, once you're going ahead and you're going to sell in the market, you need to think of a channel of distribution. So they're pretty much how you're going to get your product out, right? Um, so you can hire sales representatives and we, we cover this in a lot more detail in the other class, you know, the benefits and pluses and minuses, but sales representatives where they just, you know, go sell your product. Agents is pretty much, they're kind of representing you and can bind you. So you want to make sure you're very clear about like who are your partners on the ground and what level that they're, they're kind of representing you, you at and what contract that you have with them, right? Because sales representatives, they can do some things, but an agent can do more things, right? Like bind you if they want to say, okay, yeah, we'll, we'll go ahead and have 200 cases delivered by Wednesday. If it's an agent and they have that power, then you want to be clear of what they can and cannot do. Distributors, of course, they take title of your um, of your product normally. Retailers, it is more is a lot easier to kind of go ahead and go straight to retailers nowadays. I think a lot of retailers would have like built-in distributors and they're kind of like barely integrated now. But you know, you can go directly to the retailer and then finally the end user. The end user, of course, is like when you're just selling. You know, sometimes online, you just go straight to the end user. So number one, you want to do proper diligence. This is really high level. So, you know, I just giving you, like I said, what, but not how, but you want to do proper due diligence is very important because once again, so people can bind you and there can be issues. One thing I always say, just my little note, you should have an end date because you don't know how many people we see. They're still paying a representative in a foreign country that they do not like. And they're doing, not doing a good job because they did not provide a proper end date for the contract. So all these things you need to really think about. But you need to have partners on the ground. You need to have people you can trust, right? You're in the U.S. So this is a great strategy to kind of figure that out, figure out which one's best for you. But once again, you want to be smart about it too and do your due diligence. A few things to consider. Once again, very high level. But the size of the sales force, is it just like uh, mom and pop just working in a garage? Or do they have like more people who can help, you know, uh, sell your product if they're supposed to sell it or, you know, promote your product? The sales records, you can ask to see them. If they don't want to show them, that might be a red flag. Um, especially you're going to bind yourself to these people for any amount of time. Territorial analysis, all right? Do they represent you in the whole country? Do they represent you in one city? That This is very important. OK, so and just really understanding, like, how are how are they helping you and where okay. product mix? Do they have competing products? Hope not. You know, do they have complementary products? Hope so. But these are some conversations you need to go ahead and make sure you have. You need to really have honest conversations with anybody who's going to represent you or your product or do anything with your product or, you know, anything. Just make sure you have those conversations. Right. The facilities and equipment, if you have a, you know, um, a temperature sensitive product, right, and your product has to be refrigerated, and they're going to be your distributor, so they're going to take quite a bit of your product and, you know, and take title of it and make sure that it gets out, you want to make sure you see their facilities, but at least at least know that they have refrigerated facilities, right, so they can actually have your product properly. So all those things are very important. Marketing policies. If you just hire just a marketer, sometimes people are now hiring like a TikTok marketer or they're hiring like social media marketer and all that kind of stuff. 
So I said, can help you out with that. A lot of times for reimbursement for those very interesting kind of people. But if you're going to do that and, and have like a whole marketing scheme and you're using people on the ground, you want to make sure that you go ahead and vet those people and understand what their policies are, right? How are you paying them? Is it, you know, per response or is it, you know, per campaign or what? Customer profiles, do not be afraid to ask to see their customers, right? And then per, their promotional thrust, like, like, do they have a lot of kind of thrust behind how they promote the product? Or is it really just going to, you know, sit online on some random website that no one goes to and that's how they're selling your product? So very important to consider these things. And I'm going to circle this really big. Do proper due diligence and have an end date. Just want to throw that out there. So finding buyers. This is very important. Um, this we kind of have Danielle comes in because Danielle has so many services to help you find buyers. But in buyer, inbound buyers programs, trade missions, trade shows, websites, networking, trade industry events. These are all ways. Uh, I won't kind of spend a lot of time on that, but you can even go on the events page for Susta right now and probably sign up for something to help you find um, some buyers, right? Or at least get your product out there. But participating in these things are very helpful. We go over a little bit, few more strategies in the 12 hour course, but in a nutshell, um, kind of participating in these things are very helpful. So let's go ahead because we have a few more minutes. I want to cover a few more topics. So we're going to talk about topic seven, pro forma invoices and inco terms. So very important, very, very important. So let's go ahead and say, I'm gonna put this up. Let's go ahead and say for right now, you're happy, um, your efforts worked, your market research worked, your export plan worked, you, you changed your product, you got it priced right, and everything's great. You have a buyer, you're excited. Now it's time to put it down on paper, right? To have an invoice, right? Um, and so usually what you do is in the initial step is the pro forma invoice when you export. So it's a quotation prepared in a format of an invoice, as a preferred method of in the exporting business. So you can use this with any international quotation, even when it's not asked. And really just helps you collect a little bit more information than you would for from a regular um, invoice. And so usually this is going to be the basis of the commercial invoice, which is the final bill of sale. Your perform performer invoice is not the final invoice. And you would not be surprised how many people come to us and say, I don't understand. My buyer's not taking my pro forma invoice like as the final bill of sale because it's not. It's not. Right. This is the, the pre step. The final bill of sale will be the commercial invoice. That's what's shipped with the product. And that's what's actually they assess the taxes off of and that kind of stuff. The commercial invoice. But basically, this is a step before. So you have a meeting of the mind. So you make sure that everyone's on right, uh, you know, on one accord. Okay. So it, like I said, includes more details than you're used to writing to in quotations, but the extra detail can save time and prevent um, errors later on. The two things you want to consider before you start writing a pro forma invoice is your pricing strategy. Hopefully you've kind of already negotiated the price before you're at this stage, but making sure your pricing's right, right? The next thing you want to consider is the level of risk for the shipment. And that's the inkle term. OK, and so you want to have these two things nailed down before you go ahead and give someone your pro forma invoice. We talked about the pricing strategy in detail. Let's go ahead and start talking about the inco terms. So what are inco terms? Because usually you have to put them in your pro forma invoice. Everything else is kind of like the same. The buyer's name, the seller's name, this, you know, the location is going to being very specific. And and the full course, we go over it and we show you examples of what they look like. But the one thing they are going to ask for in a pro forma invoice is the inco term, which is a terms of sale. So you have to make sure you understand what they are and what they do and what they require from you and what they require from the buyer before you send that pro forma invoice or sign it or anything, right? So inkle terms are called terms of sale. And what it does is it spells out which parties are responsible to pay and assume the risk at each stage of the international transit of goods. OK, so because you're not just shipping to like down the road. Right. I'm in North Carolina. I'm going to ship it to South Carolina. Right. No, I might be shipping this to Australia. OK, so that means they're they're likely going to be a few more risk and a few more things to pay for uh, for this international transit of goods. And what Eagle Terms do, does is just specify in very quick terms. So if I see the term DDP, I know exactly who's responsible for paying what and who's liable for what. 
right? Who is responsible and liable for paying for or paying for the management of the the managing of the shipment, the insurance, the documentation, customs clearance, all of that, even tariffs, right? It specifies exactly who pays for what and who's responsible for what. So these are quick examples. Um, one of the common Inkle terms, and there are some caveats uh, for some of them and for all of them, actually, all of them have its pluses and minuses. But one example is X words. You'll see the Inkle term EXW. And some people say to me, well, I only use X words, right? I don't want to use any other Inkle term. That's fine if you have a buyer willing to use X works and do X works for you. But sometimes the buyer is not willing to do that. So you need to make sure you're familiar with all of them. What is X works? X works is when the buyer is responsible to pay for picking up the product at your facility and then arranging everything else, insurance, customs clearance, paying the duties and taxes. All you do is you say, pick up this product at my doorstep, 12 p.m. on Friday. That's it. Buyer, you're responsible for everything. Even like taking care of like, you know, the, um, uh, like like the customs clearance on the U.S. side or, you know, um, doing the paperwork as far as, you know, the exports, um, yeah, all of that, you leave it to the buyer. Another example is DDP. And that's when the seller is responsible for delivering the goods duty paid at the buyer's place. That's the exact opposite. That's when you, the seller, is responsible for every step, right? You actually even pay the duties and normally you never pay the duties, but you actually put it on the ship you actually, you know, you're responsible for it crossing the water. You're responsible for it offloading on the foreign country. You're responsible to get it to the, the, the other person's doorstep and you pay for the taxes. So that's the exact opposite. And some people come to me and say, Victoria, I don't understand. Why am I paying for the duties? I know I'm not supposed to. I say, which income term did you use? They chose DDP. They didn't know they did. They just did, right? So these things really are important. You have to understand how you use them. So you must understand the terms of sale before using them in a quotation and pro forma invoice. This is still so high level, so I can't really get into all of them, but I'm just going to show you my example with this chart of what I just said. X works, the buyer's responsible for everything very quickly, right? Load it on the truck for your facility. Um, you, you're going to do the any kind of export declarations. Um, you're going to get it on the truck. And you're going to get it to the port. You're going to unload it on the port. You're responsible for getting it um, on the boat. You're responsible for the transit over the water. And then on the other side, getting it off the port on the other side and getting it to the foreign destination. And you're responsible for cargo insurance and clearance and paying taxes. So the buyer is responsible for everything. All you do is say, pick it up. Versus, I'm going to show you the bottom because there's a whole bunch of stuff in the middle that we'll cover in the 12-hour class. DDP, that's when you are responsible for all those steps and import taxes, which normally you never are. The buyer is, right? So if you choose to sell them, the point is, if you don't know which one you're choosing, you're going to have issues, right? We don't have time to cover all of this. Once again, this is just what, not how, but we'll go ahead and cover it in the 12-hour course, but just want to show you what, what it is. So once you go ahead and, and take care of the pro forma invoice, then basically you can do the commercial invoice, which is the final bill of sale. And then, you know, everything will be agreed upon. It's a legal document between the seller and buyer describing the goods and price and then key documents for custom clearance and determining customs duties. Um, it usually has many of the same details from the pro forma invoice, but this is an official, official kind of bill of sale. Okay, let's go quickly to shipping and logistics. Consi what con to consider when shipping abroad? Once again, very high level. We talk about a lot more detail, but packaging, packaging is very important, especially when it comes to all the new requirements all over the world. So making sure your, your product is packaged right, not the actual product itself, but the way you ship it, right? Are you using wood, any kind of wood? Is it wound, the wood fumigated, all that kind of stuff. So understanding that, labeling your product for shipping, like sometimes you have to put a label. If you get like a, a sanitary certificate, you have to have like a label on the outside of each of your shipments and all that kind of stuff. Insurance requirements and regulations. So it's very important that you understand before you ship that product, what, what is required. This will ensure that the product is packaged correctly. So it arrives in good condition, is labeled correctly to ensure that goods are handled properly and arrive on time and at the right place. Right. Sometimes you have to put it in foreign languages, right? Because not everybody at the port might speak English. So you need to make sure that you know if you have to do that or not. Make sure it's do documented correctly to meet U.S. and foreign government import requirements. 
And then you want to make sure that you, of course, uh, don't have damage, loss, or pilferage and delay. You can get insurance. You won't cover insurance now, but that's for the next class. But you always want to think about insurance. Some of the ankle terms make you liable for insurance or make the other person liable for insurance. That's why you also need to figure out the ankle term too. So a freight forwarder, I want to stress this. Um, usually we have a freight forwarder join us for our, our class. The freight forwarder is your friend. Very much so. It's an agent that ships cargo to an overseas destination. Usually they are familiar with import rules, but once again, you better know yourself because you can't say, oh, the freight forwarder told me. Like they'll be like, I don't know what you're saying, right? So make sure you know the foreign input requirements. You can't just rely on the freight forwarder, like if you need a certificate of origin or if you need a five cents or certificate. That's something that the the those foreign input requirements will tell you. But sometimes your freight forwarder will know too. You want to make sure that they're licensed and not you're just dealing with a broker, you're paying someone money for nothing, you know, because you can just go right to the right freight forward, the whole freight forwarder. They're very helpful to assist with price quotations, which is very important with pro forma invoices. And they also help with freight costs, port charges, cost of special documentation, insurance costs, and then of course their own fees. And they also can help with recommending about packaging, which is very important. Reviewing letters of credit. We're not gonna cover that too much here. That's the last topic we'll get to in like one minute. Um, commercial invoices and packing lists. They can reserve space on board an ocean vessel, which is very important. Um, now it's getting easier. Before, you need weeks of, of time in advance, right? And so they can help you do that. Arrange with customs brokers to ensure compliance, prepare bills of lading, special documentation, and all of that great stuff. So modes of transportation, that's pretty simple. Land, air, sea time. Um, you see, see maritime, you only have about three modes of transportation. Um, you want to always consider which one you're going to use because you usually have options, right? Well, not really. If you're going to ship to Japan, you can't use land, right? But if you're going to ship to Mexico, you can use all three. So you want to consider which one might be best. The freight forwarder will help you out. But part of it is your cost, your time frame. If you told your client you're going to get there, it's going to get there in two weeks. So you might not be able to use C, right? But your freight forwarder can help you figure that out the weight of it, because that will, you know, go to the cost. And then if you need any additional transportation, like ground transportation to the port, but these are some things to consider and the freight forwarder can help you out. Uh, a few other things you want to think about is the commercial um, invoices that usually is included, uh, pre-shipment inspections, you need to kind of have proof of that, any kind of certificates, export controls, and then the, the, the documents that are used in the movement of goods. So there's a lot of documents that you're going to use, and we'll show you in a second what most of those documents are. One important thing is, this is the only thing the U.S. government requires. Only thing. Everything else is required by the foreign, um, the foreign government. Um, there's always a foreign import requirements. But the U.S. government requires an electronic export information, the EEI. OK, there are some rules we can't go over all over here. It's like one Schedule B number under twenty five hundred. That's for the 12 hour class. But usually they must be filed electronically by a business, a freight for or a third party. If someone else does it for you, you're still responsible because you are the person who's, you know, you are the exporter of the good. OK, so you can use a system to file it electronically and you need an export license only if a limited time, uh, limited circumstances, like if you're going to ship to an embargo uh, country. But normally you don't need an export license. You only have to fill out this special form. And so that's how the government tracks all of the exports. And that's how they can give you really good data from the U.S. Census Bureau. Right. They 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 track, you know, how things are exported using the system. So finally, the freight forwarder and customs broker, they're familiar with documents, but I want to stress this, you are responsible, right, for all the documents. So you have to really make sure you understand. Um, very quickly, usually we'll, we'll show you examples, but not right now. The export packing list is something you have to really know about. Shipper's instructions are very important because if it's not written on the shipper's instruction, it's not going to happen and they're going to deny anything about it, right? So everything, any kind of particular rule, you have a letter of credit, your document has to be shipped to this bank, um, you know, all these things have to be cap captured in the shipper's instruction. The bill of lading is very important. That's like kind of like the, you know... Um, the bill of sale for, for the shipment, um, and then the airway bill if you're using air. So these are um, very important documents. Finally, our last topic um, is types of payment options. Daniel, let me just ask you, I'm not sure, am I doing good on time? I'm not sure if I have a little bit of time or what, what, what we're supposed to end at 11. I only have one more topic left. This is going to be pretty fast too. 
Um, yeah, you've got time. So. Oh, great. Okay, yeah. great. I would say go <laughs> I'm like flying. Yeah, yeah, okay, yeah. great. No, Perfect. no, that's all right. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Yay. Okay. So export payments, financing, and insurance. We're not really going to cover so much insurance right now, but um, so types of payment options. This is so important um, because there are a variety of payment tools depending on the level of trust and credit worthiness of the buyer. Each market is different. Each buyer is different, right? And so sometimes people will say, well, I only do this. I only take payments in advance. That's great, right? But sometimes your buyer is not going to do that, right? Um, and, and sometimes in the culture, it's not even culturally acceptable to do that. So you always have to know what types of payment options are available to you and utilize them based on the level of trust you have and the credit, credit worthiness of the buyer. Or... Also, if things are not so stable in the country, you want to consider that too. Because sometimes a buyer might really want to pay you, right? And they seem to be credit worthy, but something may have happened in the economy that just caused it to dip and now they can't pay you. So you always want to think about these things when you think about the type of payments that you're going to accept for your goods. So I have them ordered for from most secured to the buyer and least secure for the, uh, wait, most secured. Yeah, for the exporter um, to lease secure for the exporter. And I'll show you pretty much because it's a really a reciprocal relationship. Uh, things that are more secure for you are riskier for the buyer. It's just, it's just how it is. And things that are less secure for you um, are better for the buyer, right? And so let's see it together. So exporters risk and then importers risk. First, you have cash in, cash in advance. This is the best thing, right? We all want cash in advance. That means, of course, they pay you in advance before you ship or export your product, okay? That's what we all love. Now, that is perfect for you as an exporter. You're all happy. You got cash in advance. But for the importer, they don't know you. They're trusting that if they send you their cash, you're going to send them product, right? So it is much more riskier for them. So you can see if you have a buyer, especially if it's a big enough order and they're like, well, I'm not going to do cash in advance, right? And you'll be like, okay, well, he's not going to do cash in advance. I got to try something else. Because you can see that's a risk for them, right? And sometimes people say, I only do cash in advance. But if you're going to do that and draw that hard line, then you're going to miss out on some sales, okay? So that that is the first option. Great for you, right? And you can do wire transfer, credit card. A, a, to me, a check is not really cash in advance. You might as well have that as an open account because you don't know. Just anything can happen to a check. But if you can kind of go and get that wire transfer or something like that, that's great. Letters of credit. That's the next level. Um, it's, it's, you know, less riskier for you, but then there might be some risk for your ex importer. Um, that's when the importer's bank, not your bank, and we go over this in great detail, but the importer's bank pays upon the receipt um, um, of shipping documents, right? And confirmed usually by... Um, a foreign bank. So basically the the um, the importer will have his bank uh, go ahead and act as an intermediary. And basically his bank will go ahead and pay upon the receipt of shipping documents. So once once the documents come in um, to the port and they can see that you shipped the, doc, the product, so they trust you a little bit more, then their bank will go ahead and pay you. This works really well if you don't really trust so much the, the buyer but you trust his bank, right? You're like, okay, I don't know you and your business look a little bit sketchy. The website says it was updated in 2018. Not sure, but your bank looks good. So let's go and do this deal with a letter of credit, okay? Um, sometimes if you're not really sure about the buyer or his bank or her bank, then you can have a confirming bank in the US at another layer. So you're like, I'm not sure about you. I'm not sure about you, but I trust my bank. And so there's another layer. Normally we have a um, financial, um, an international banker join us, which is very helpful. People have all kinds of questions, of course, um, but letters of credit are great, but there can be discrepancies and that kind of stuff. And so and it, it can be can kind of costly. Discrepancies mean they can pick any little thing sometimes and say, I'm not going to pay you. Or the bank's going to be like, I'm not going to pay you because this wasn't right. So you want the freight forwarder to, of course, look at, um, you know, your your, your bills, um, your, uh, your letter of credit to make sure that everything will be in compliance so they won't find a discrepancy. Quickly, documentary collection. 
uh, that that is a little more riskier for you uh, because basically still involved banks, you have your bank and they have their bank, but the banks only kind of like push paper around, really. It's like, you know, once the bank go ahead and receive like information that you've actually shipped the product so they trust you, then they'll go ahead and, and send payment. But they aren't putting their own credit on the line, right? They aren't saying, well, if he doesn't pay, I'll pay. Basically, they're just pretty much collecting payment once documents. They're pretty much just intermediaries, but they're not putting the credit of their bank online, okay? So this is helpful, once again, a little bit less beneficial than a letter of credit, but, you know, the bankers do it all the time, where at least you have some kind of intermediaries kind of there who, you know, will go ahead and, and kind of help service, right? Make sure a payment is sent once they receive information that you ship the product, but it's not like the bank will pay if, if the buyer fails to. Um, and then finally, an open account. Really, that is so beneficial, of course, to the buyer, right? Because, you know, basically they get the product and they pay you sometime later, right? So, um, so you're kind of out of your product and, you know, you don't know if they're going to pay, but they already have your product. So they're happy. So open account is the product and documents are shipped before payment is due. If you do that, you want to consider Exum Bank Export Insurance to maybe, kept, you know, kind of cover some of those liabilities. Now, I see some people, they say, well, I only do open account. Well, that's great. But then I ask them, like, so who are your clients? Oh, it's like the whole food of Panama. It's the whole foods of, like, Japan or something like that. Well, yeah, if you're dealing with a huge, you know, national chain, then you probably can do open account, right? But everyone's not so lucky. So I want to stress each client is different, client meaning customer, right, or buyer. So the buyer may demand a letter of credit or the buyer may demand an open account. And this may be such a big deal that you say, okay, I don't want to lose this buyer. So I'm going to go ahead and get export bank insurance. But there's that reciprocal relationship, and basically, you know, something that's benefit for the buyer is usually kind of less benefit, beneficial for you, but that's a negotiation you're going to have to do with your buyer. Um, so the other thing you can consider is foreign exchange ex issues. Um, this is very important. We always usually say you want to go ahead and have everything based on the U.S. dollar, right? Just, just for stability, right? Um, but you don't have to be the U.S. dollar. It could be the, the currency of the U.S. It could be the currency of your foreign uh, partner. So if you're shipping to Japan, you might use Jap Japanese yen. You can choose any other currency too, right? But you want to just choose a stable currency, <laughs> right? A stable one. Sometimes when you have a buyer and they're, they might insist that you use, you know, their own currency, you'll say only US dollar. They'll say no, no, no. Why? Because they have other people who can get them the same product probably and their local currency, or they'll just go with a domestic company, right? Or someone else in the US who's willing to use a yen and you're not. So being competitive, you want to really think about your options, but if everyone is agreeable, because you can't force this, right? The buyer has thoughts too. He's a buyer or she's a buyer. Try to find something that's stable. So you also, of course, you have risk of foreign exchange rates. If you choose something that's outside the U.S., you know, currency, and you want to just always have tools to minimize risk. And um, a lot of times you can have your banker, they have tools uh, like a forward contract or something they can kind of put in place to help you there. So payment problems, this is this is just how it works, right? That's why I love having a seasoned exporter come and talk to us because, you know, they have great stories and they have like, oh, not so great stories. But, you know, sometimes you may have payment problems, you know, it's just like, just like domestically, right? You're chasing your money. So if that's the case, you know, you want to, of course, avoid non-payment issues. Part of that is maybe getting something in advance, cash in advance, or find a safer payment method. But if you chose open account and, you know, like, and there's nothing really that you can do about it, um, then basically you want to look at your options for non-payment. Usually it's like mediation or arbitration. We talk about this in more details, but other ways. A lot of times, once again, it's not because a person doesn't want to pay. It could be turmoil, which is why you have to choose the market carefully. It could have been something happened or something like that. And their overall economy that makes them not able to pay. I think you might just want to just take your time and work with the person.
So finally, financing and credit insurance options. Um, you have the Exxon Bank, just very high level. They have, of course, financing and credit insurance options. The credit insurance, once again, if you choose a riskier payment option, then they can kind of step in and give you credit insurance. And then financing, you can kind of, you know, you can get financing from Exxon Bank too. Um, then SBA, they have an export working capital loan program advantageous if you have to kind of, you know, get working capital for you to export. And then USDA has an export credit guarantee program. It's very limited. Um, and usually it's it's really uh, kind of for people in foreign countries to utilize so they can kind of be prepared to receive your exports, uh, kind of like the other way around, it's based on a letter of credit. But these are just some options. Can we talk about in great detail now? But basically, these are just some ways if you need financing options. And the Exxon Bank is always great, once again, for credit insurance, for riskier payment pro, um, options if you chose one. So finally, we have the Q&A session. If anyone has questions, um, we'll be happy to kind of answer them. I know, and I haven't seen any come in yet, but I've been keeping an eye on it. Feel free to type any questions in the Q&A or the chat. I know that was a lot of information, all really good and helpful, um, but maybe everybody is also digesting all of that. <laughs> uh, somebody asked, what's the cost of the 12-hour course? Great question. It is $150, but we have an early bird fee, so it's only $125 until I think September 7th is the deadline for that. Um, I'll send everybody the link to that if you want to register. Um we usually keep it to about 15 people per class just so that it can be, you know, personalized and uh, really thorough. We don't want it to be too big of a class and then people can't ask questions and really integrate into it. Um, so we do have some spots still open for that. Um, and yeah, and Victoria is our teacher and does a great job um, of really delving into all those topics, as she mentioned. So it's great. Um, there's just a lot of moving parts and pieces to making smart decisions when you're exporting. Um, so you don't have to do it alone. <laughs> Thank goodness. <laughs> uh -huh. And just to piggyback on that, Danielle, yeah. um, you know, we, we do love it because sometimes we'll have a company and the same person kind of signs up for each session. Sometimes we have a company participate and they'll have like the marketing person do the market research the first session and the person who ships will do the third session. We're fine with that too. Sometimes company will sign up multiple <laughs> people <laughs> from their company. Uh, we want to train the company, right? So that the company is successful. Um, and then basically if you have more than one participant, we just give you a certificate for your company and not the individual person. It doesn't say the person's name. But if you're thinking about it and you're like, oh, well, you know, this person needs to be sitting on that piece and we really need this person who handles like, you know, on the ground, you know, they can really talk about, you know, learn about the buyers and partners and that kind of stuff. Then we're very flexible. Just, you know, sign everybody up and we'll, we'll figure, you know, we'll kind of learn which session who's going to be in and that kind of stuff because that's been beneficial too. Yep, smart. Oh, I see somebody else coming through with a question. It says hello. Yeah, I'm okay. guessing that he or she is is writing it. Uh, oh, okay. Maybe I don't know. We'll see. <laughs> um, I know, and if anybody has questions, I know Victoria mentioned um, a few times that Susta can help with things like packaging and labels. Oh, yeah. Sorry. <laughs> um, and that kind of thing. Feel free to, I mean, I'm happy to talk with anybody about those programs and how we can, um, you know, we have a, the 50% reimbursement of things like modifying packaging and labels. Um, sorry, I missed the cost of the class. So if you register before September 7th, it's 125 and after that, it's 150 Well, great. And then just a final, you know, reminder, if you you, you didn't remember like the dates, uh, they're going to be 10-4, 10-11, 10-18. Um, as soon as you sign up uh, for the class, we send you like a little invite for all the dates to put on your calendar for you <laughs> to help you out. Um, yes. And so, um, but yeah, then we'll send you like that, that little questionnaire. But yeah, yep. that's kind of, yeah, kind of all I have there. Yeah. yeah, wonderful. Um, well, thank you so much, Victoria. Um, this was great. And thank you all for joining us. Uh, we have another webinar coming up on September 13th. It's going to be about um, getting your labels ready for Canada. So we have a specialist 
who really focuses on that market and on label compliance. Um, and then following that in October, we have one, um, a webinar about Mexico. So keep an eye on those. I will uh, make sure to have everything in the email as well. Um, but we just want to make sure that everybody's well-educated and, uh, and that we can answer all your questions. All right. Thank you so much, Victoria. Thank you. Thank you right. so much. Take care. Bye-bye. Okay. Bye-bye.